Hi everybody, Michael Angelo Badio here. Joey! And this is Robert, he is very angry today. Welcome to another installment of No Boundaries. Got some good things to talk about today. The topic is one that has been discussed many times over the years, how to play fast. And there is an instructional program that teaches you specifically how to play fast speed kills. It seems that what I thought back in the past about using methodology of what I learned in school at the university and about the way people learn piano has seemed to translate over the years, which I was hoping it would. And I always thought about what would this program be like years from when I filmed it. And it's everything I thought and, and much more. I'm really happy. There is a special on Speed Kills. It's called the Beyond Speed Kills Bundle. And there was some confusion about my learn hyphen to shred hyphen, you know, uh, uh, how can I say URL. So today it's just go to metalmethod.com if you're interested in getting it. You'll see all the different instructors, then you can go to my page. But the company is called Metal Method, metalmethod.com. Now, I want to uh, give a few shout outs. Hey, Joel, uh, Greg, John, Peter, yes. Uh, Roxana, Tanya, Denny, Brett. Uh, I see Jenny out there. Uh, it's a good day today. So, but what I also wanted to say is that when it comes to playing fast, one of the things that I've learned, there's, there's a lot of people that offer opinions, everything from you know, you put on an exercise. I can just sit there and go. I can play this exercise all day. There's going to be somebody who goes, that's not music, bro. David Gilmore, you can play more with one note that you can do with that, man. I do not know why. I don't understand. I cannot wrap my head. Joey doesn't understand. I don't know. I can't understand how somebody could confuse an exercise with music. An exercise is to develop techniques to be able to play music better. What's so hard to grasp about that? But it happens every day of my life. Somebody will comment on something, whether it was me and Joey playing the warm-up exercise with Manowar, because, you know, especially with a band like Manowar, when you turn around and say, yeah, man, play some music, well, Manowar sold 20 million albums, and they've got a lot of great songs. The music's there. So, you know, what's your point? If the exercises are there, and it's not about me. It has never been about me. It's not about playing. I mean, look at my hand technique. I'm left-handed. Vinnie Moore's left-handed. Herman Lee's left-handed. I'm pretty sure Steve Morse is left-handed, too. There are a lot of lefty guitar players out there and this is what it means, that the picking hand, Robert, was not and is not our strong hand. This is the dominant hand, which is why I can do all this on guitar. But it meant that for myself personally, I had to work harder to get this hand to be as good as this. In Speed Kills, I don't talk about to put your hand like mine. I did a study of picking, and I've talked about this numerous times, about the two different ways. Basically, hands on, hands off. You know, it sounds like the Karate Kid. Hands on, hands off. And so what I mean by that is there's two basic disciplines. A free-floating movement like this. You see people like Al Miola in the old days, John McLaughlin, Robert Fripp, a lot of players play like this. A lot of jazz players play like this. A lot of young guitar players play like this. Or you can put your hands on. One finger, two fingers, three fingers, rest your hand down. Somewhere along the line. And here's the key thing. It doesn't have to look like mine. It has to be just one of the two. That's all you can do. And so when I showed these exercises... They were never, ever about, play like Mikey, play like me, oh, I'm so wonderful, I, I, me, 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 me. It's not about that. What it is about is these are the techniques 
this is the way you play it to become great at that technique. Then you use it for whatever music you want. And, and that's it. And, you know, I'm not saying because I'm mad or, or, you know, somebody said haters are just jealous of me. You know, it's not like I get upset about this because I don't. I really don't. I'm just trying to steer everybody in the right direction. If somebody wants to say anything about me, I don't really care. The only place I care is on my own pages. And I've talked about this numerous times. This is my house. So whatever you want to say, you never see me comment outside my own pages. I don't care. I really, truly don't. I can accept criticism, both good and bad. Uh, you know, I know what I play like and I know where I'm at in my career. But these programs, Speed Kills and the other ones, were designed to help. And I am an impartial teacher. I have no prejudice against a genre of music, a band, an artist, a technique. I'm not somebody who says sweet picking sucks. Why? You know, it's like uh, there are other guitar players. Hey, sweet picking sucks. And I made the joke. Okay, talk to me, baby. Were you hurt by a sweep? Did a sweep break your heart? Did it, did it give a lasting impression on you? Who cares? What if I hired you to play a, uh, on one of my albums and you didn't get paid unless you had to play the sweep because it was part of the music? Can you imagine being in Frank Zappa's band and some of the intense music and you refused to play what he wrote because you didn't like the style? I didn't like sweeps. I'd prefer to play it somewhere else. Zappa would go, really? Out! Next! Uh, even in the 80s, all the big producers, when I worked with Tom Worman, he didn't care. He, he produced all these big bands. If the guitarist couldn't play the part, he would get somebody who did. He didn't care. All that he cared about was that you could play the part. And, and I've seen it firsthand with other producers. So that's what Speed Kills is about. Now, this is uh, the haters fear you. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, the, it, somebody wrote, MAB doesn't get mad, he gets even. You're damn right I do. Now, my, you know, the best way to, to, uh, to stop a hater is just, you know, there's, I, I don't know if I can say this exactly, but haters you... 99.99% of, of the time never talk about somebody who's doing worse than they are. They always talk about somebody who's doing better. So, you know, consider the source. But I really did these to help you. Metalmethod.com. Now, this is a sawtooth production, but I wanted to talk about that because I use sawtooth guitars all the time, and I'm really happy with them, and I'm really proud of the fact that in this era of all these different brands, boutique guitar players, big companies, Sawtooth has really been able to carve a considerable mark uh, in the industry. And some of the things that we've done, I mean, we created a hybrid guitar that no one had ever done. You know, people say, well, it looks like Steve Morse's guitar. Not many people said that. Well, yeah, it might. I don't know. But um, not the pickup, you know, because he put more pickups. But they were not single coils, hybrids, where you literally, I don't like to use that word all the time, everybody does. Well, I literally did this and literally, I was literally like this, literally. So, but what we did, we were able to put lipstick pickups from a tally style guitar and single coils right against humbuckers and create two guitars at the same time in one guitar. We're the only company who pulled it off. And even the people that made it at first, well, you can't do this. And and uh, Joe Fuco, the main owner with Kevin Osborne, Joe and I worked on the design. And we're and we're and the question is, why not? Why can't you do it? You know, people said, oh, you can't do a double guitar. Why not? And speaking of doubles, Steve Vai, I truly like and respect Steve Vai. I truly do. And We've known each other. We're not super close friends, but we've known each other a long time. And he said some really nice things about me recently in an article about his heart guitar because he gave me credit for, for getting the idea of the heart guitar from me and gave me credit for being the first. But he mentioned about how he couldn't play it at all. And he said he doesn't know, even know how I was able to do it, but he did it. And, you know, he learned things that he could do very proficiently. And I, the one thing that, there's many things that I like about Steve Vai, but one uh, thing that I live by is that he's the best Steve Vai he can be. And uh, that's all I've ever strove to be, the best Michelangelo Badio I could be. Not the best Michelangelo Badio plays Randy Rhodes or plays Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix is Jimi Hendrix. 
uh, Randy Rhodes is Randy Rhodes. Jimmy Page is Jimmy Page. John McLaughlin, the list goes on. So I never wanted to be them. I wanted to be the best me I could be. And when I play their music, it is my interpretation of how I look at their music, and it's to pay respect and reverence. So getting back to Sawtooth, we have developed some really cool guitars, and it's very, very easy to spend $20,000, $25,000, $30,000, dude, to get your own guitar. If you hire a luthier and you say, Arias, I would like the, I don't like this phrase, equal temperament. Did you know that's not what they called it at, in, in universities? Well, they called it well-tempered. Equal temperament. First of all, our notes aren't equal. Our, our, the pitches in our tonal system, some of them are slightly out of tune. They are not equal. Equal temperament is a wrong way to say it, but it's one of the new ways that people interpret uh, the uh, traditional music theory. But getting back to, you know, whether, whether it's... Uh, you know, a $5,000 guitar, a $10,000 guitar. When you get a, a guitar and you have somebody hand build it and use the best parts, you can get whatever you want and it's going to cost you. But you can get what you want if you have the money to pay for it. What I loved about what Sawtooth did is the value of the products. We, this is a Floyd Rose made in Germany. It is the best Floyd Rose on the planet. Whether you put this in a $30,000 guitar or a $50 gu guitar, dollar guitar, it doesn't matter. It's still a Floyd Rose built in Germany. It's still the best on the planet. Whether you use Canadian maple or special maple tree, there is a little variance in the woods. That's what separates the absolute best guitars from the ones that aren't quite the best because you can, you know, people will choose from a factory maybe not the greatest piece of flame maple. There are different grades of flame. I, I have over 250 guitars in my collection. I have the top quality flame instruments that are available on this planet. But, and I also have ones that aren't as good. But here's what, what I think is a very subtle difference that makes a lot of difference. And what I mean by this is the difference between good wood, average wood, and the best wood becomes slightly blurred when you have the best electronic components. Because if you put the best Floyd, the best pickups, the best wiring, the best tuners, and you have a good neck and good wood on the body, I defy somebody, and I can say this from recording, I defy somebody to really hear the difference if I plug both guitars in. If they're similar, obviously if you plug one in that's single coil, the other one is, uh, you know, uh, humbuckers, you're going to hear, you know, you're going to hear a difference. But when you add electronics and you put the best parts in, the line between the greatest wood ever and average to good wood becomes blurred because the electronics are the same in both, whether you pay 500 bucks or, or 50,000. So this is uh, why I wanted to, uh, let's see, Jason Newstead. That can't be Jason. I know Jason. Anyway, uh, somebody wrote Jason Newstead. Oh, okay. Anyway, so yeah, I, I met Jason at Metallica's first show with him, with Jim Gillette, because Jim uh, went to school with him. But anyway... Now, so regarding Sawtooth, so I love to read the comments here. What we are doing this year, we have some new models that, that have been in the queue that are finally coming out. We have, a, it's called a Primal Red, and it's really cool. It was the relic version where, where a human had to take a template and create our design of the relic and we're doing one in blue, and then we're going to add a couple other colors, and you're going to see some new uh, variations of this M24. I have a new double guitar that's going to be in stock very soon. We're going to do a limited edition run. It's super pointy and bad. I have to say, I think this is... It's hard to say because, you know, my other doubles are really cool, the pointy ones, but this one, I think, is it's it's at least as cool, if not cooler, than any 
double I've ever come up with in my life. And again, it was me and uh, Joe Fuco and Joey, one of the uh, the main USA. He's head of all the uh, the luthier things, and you know he's the main guy that oversees setups in the USA at Sawtooth. So between the three of us, we came up with a really incredible design for this guitar. Now, how does this uh, have? What does this have to do with playing fast? One of the things I've learned over the years, and I can't stress enough that you know, I'm, last week I played a lot on the live stream. Today I'm talking more, but the essence of playing fast is has not changed since I did my very first instructional video or program before even Speed Kills. It was called the Starlix video, which is also available. That is the very first shred program ever made. For the first time ever, you got to see an arpeggio. That one that everybody uses nowadays. A lot of the techniques that I talked about were talked about for the first time. I didn't say I invented all of them. That's not what I said. I said they were talked about on a program for everybody to watch for the first time. And some of the things like my over under, that's my design, you know, my invention, the double guitar is my invention. So yes, I've been an innovator, but when it came to doing instructional programs, a lot of these things that I showed on the very first instructional video we used to say uh, were things that I learned that nobody really taught me because I didn't have the, the uh, amount of knowledge that we have online today. It's unbelievable. Why do you think such young people are so great? Because they have free information and a free exchange of information. Music, not film, music is the freest part of the internet. If you think about it, you don't get censored for writing a bad song or you have to be careful about your politics, but you don't get censored for playing shred. You don't get censored for playing blues. You don't get censored for playing orchestral music. There is no prejudice or no bias when it comes to all these different styles. So a young person can say, I want to learn the blues. They don't just have to listen to a a song, they can go online and watch Robert Johnson. They can watch early jazz with Charlie Christian. They can watch gypsy jazz with original films of Django Reinhardt, the man. These are the actual, it's actual footage of the actual people playing. We have films that are well over a hundred years old now. And so you can art, you can watch these, they are archived. You can watch these and learn from the masters. If you want to learn shred, you've got my instructional programs that are every bit as good today as they were when I first put them out because I knew what I was doing back then. I already had my degree years before I even did my first instructional program. So the methodology was already in my head. All I had to do is translate it to you. Now, what does this have to do with playing fast? What I have learned, get Speed Kills, get the Speed Kills bundle, get beyond Speed Kills so you can go into all the details. But what I have learned, first and foremost, is to concentrate on one technique at a time, understand these are exercises and not songs, and play it as perfect as you can slow and practice it two ways. For example, just something like economy picking, which the word economy hadn't even been established as the name for this style of picking when I did speed kill. So I called it alternative because it was an alternative to alternate. Seemed logical to me. Well, it's economy. But for example, it's down, up, down, what is economy picking? Going to a new string on a downstroke. Now, this only works with odd numbers of notes per string, meaning three, maybe even if you did five, like. Then you would move, sorry, I hit a harmonic there. Then you would move to your next string. So, three notes per string is a standard for guitar. So one string, down, up, down. The new string, the same direction as the string before. Then I developed a very, very simple exercise. I found out if you do short exercises, short ones, 
and you focus 100% on, first of all, why are you doing this? To learn a specific technique. How do you do it? You play it exactly like you're supposed to. For example, down, up, down. Then you move to the next string on a downstroke. Then I develop this short exercise. Then you hit another then you hit another note on that new string on an upstroke and back down on an upstroke to a new string. So in other words, every time you go to a new string, whether it's ascending or descending, your pick stays in the same direction. That is economy picking. So in other words, think of a violin bow. Down, up, down, down, up, up. So it's a lot less bowing than doing alternate picking. If you think about it like a violin, think in terms of this. Instead of like just going back and forth as fast as you can, which would be the equivalent of this. It's all alternate picking. This is economy picking. Down, up, down, down new string, upstroke, upstroke new string. It's a simple exercise. You play it slow. Then you play it as fast as you can, crash and burn, play it sloppy, and then you back it down and use a metronome or drum machine or a drum program. So something like this. It gets so fast. And all I'm doing is just doing a quick demonstration of what I show in Speed Kills. The way to play fast is to learn how to play slow. Now here's something else, and I read this occasionally or I see somebody making a comment. For example, I did a Van Halen tribute, uh, the song. <laughs> now it's in D major, first chord, second chord, C major, third chord, B flat, so B flat down to C. So what happens? If you bend, you're gonna bend the D to F sharp, like or if you play B flat, you bend to F. Well, some pundits couldn't hear that. So oh, he's bending out of tune. Well, I'm not bending out of tune at all. You're just not listening to what I hear, and I'm doing it specifically to show how nuanced that it can be. But when I use my speed, one of the things that I've learned from becoming a really good lead guitar player and being able to play in time is it really helped my rhythm. When I got signed to Atlantic Records, when I was in the band Holland, and we used to have to do like... <laughs> recorded everything to a click. And Tom Worman, the producer of the Holland record that I was on, it was my first major label record deal on Atlantic Records. It wasn't my band. Tom Holland was a singer. But I wrote every song with Tom. So we were the main collaborators. The bass player wrote some of the songs, uh, some parts of some of the songs as well. But the majority of the material was Tom and I. And uh, the bass player would come up with uh, the song High Life. He came up with some of the main parts. And then I came up with that solo that I ultimately used in No Boundaries. But here's what Tom Warman told me. He said, he goes, Mike, you know, I think you're a great lead guitarist. He goes, but the thing that I really like is you're a great rhythm guitarist. And I'm not saying that I do downstrokes like Jim. I mean, I can easily... lot faster but I know how to play rhythm guitar in the pocket and very precisely and it helped because I, I worked very hard on my lead guitar playing and I always thought rhythm was important. when you play songs from other people when you grow up in cover bands like I did you have to learn how to play songs <laughs> these songs 
but I learned how to play in the pocket. Working out when you're playing, working out literally, literally, literally working out is literally the way to literally become literally more faster. More faster, literally. And so I'm goofing around with this. But when I consider practicing, I sometimes think about it like that. Like this is a workout that I am trying to achieve certain things. I work on down picking. Just I work on just. I work on all sorts of things, but I do it to drum software, to a drum program, so I have so I have a groove to work on. But this, uh, somebody wrote, oh, finger strength and dexterity workouts. Okay, so I had to, can you play 10,000 volts? I don't even know what that is. Anyway, uh, finger strength and dexterity. I saw somebody post recently, you know, why do teachers three, four, when it's so much better? Let me say it again because I don't know if you heard that. Why is why do teachers stress using fingers like you use stress using fingers one, two, three, four in exercises? Versus playing diatonic. Why do we do that? Because I have seen firsthand, if you just go like this, do that all day. I just play diatonically up and down, backwards and forwards. It does not give you the workout that's something so simple as this. I have seen this over and over and over over the years. I will give this to a student. Just say, and I don't teach privately at all anymore. I haven't for many, many years. But when I did, and even when I do master classes, and I see usually the person's fingers are all over the place. Secondly, this calibrates the three components, your brain, your, your fretboard hand, your picking hand. You have to get all three in sync. And I found when you do what I did last week where I showed everybody my warm-up exercise where I go fingers one and two all the way down the fretboard or all the way up. Sometimes I'll go straight up, then I'll do finger one and three down, then one and four up, two and three down, two and four up, three and four down. Then I do... <laughs> Then I'll do. All the way up and down. Then I end with. Now what. Why do people not like that? Oh, it's not musical. Oh, it's, I, it, it, it doesn't touch me like comfortably now. I don't feel comfortably numb when I hear. What I feel is comfortably warmed up. And so what happens when you do these exercises is your fingers start to work together as a team. And these little muscles in here, I don't know if uh, everybody knows that just this finger here, your ring finger, is controlled by two tendons. So you have one tendon here and another one here that controls this. So just this finger alone, you can have a problem right here and you're screwed up. And so this tendon can work properly and this one might not. And so when you do these simple exercises like this, what are you focusing on? You're focusing on hand technique. You're focusing on playing it perfectly. You're focusing on playing it in time and it really helps to get your fingers warmed up. And that's, uh, I can't uh, stress this enough. I've showed this on, on Speed Kills, one of the different programs. I've showed my warm up. But if you do these things, playing fast can be something that's learned. And I have enough material now to do a new instructional program. I have some new techniques that I've been working on to get people to, to that have been in a rut, that you know can only play 80 or 90 BPM 
uh, you know, at 16th notes or 120 when, you know, myself, Joey from Manimal, we can play, you know, 30 notes a second. You know, it gets in crazy. And, and so, you know, in this, the insane speeds we can reach, but there's a, there's a way to do this where you can increase. You, you don't always have to be stuck at one plateau, and I found a lot of people get there. Well, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, let's see. Michael, will you give me the keys to the Lamborghini? Okay. People that know me, I have been asked that question thousands of times over the years, so I have developed an answer. And my answer to people that say, dude, man, can you give me the keys to the Lamborghini, bro? Or, oh, I'm still waiting for the keys. I don't have the keys, bro. I have to say right back, I have given you the keys. It's up to you to drive the car. So I have my response. But I really feel that it's true. That I can give you, it's the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. I can give you a blueprint, but I cannot make you build the building, or I can't. I can give you the roadmap. Speed Kills is a GPS to get you from slow to fast, but I can't make you follow that route. That's up entirely up to you. I can't make you detour. I can't make you, it's a, it's a road that not always straight. You have to move around sometimes. And also too, when people ask me, well, should I work on one technique at a time and master that before I start something else? No, that one of the beauties of playing guitar is once you warm up your fingers, it's like working out with weights. If you do the same thing every day, your gains will be less and less because your muscles know in advance what you're going to do. They get used to it. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger used to say, now I'm not uh, saying this verbatim, but you need to trick your muscle. You need to concentrate on what you're going to do. Like if you're doing biceps or triceps or lats, what you need to do is focus on that muscle and don't, you don't train it every day. You vary the workouts, just like you do in music. You vary your workout. So some days when I do my warm-up and I get finished with the... <laughs> picking but I do it to a drum program so it's a whatever I just like a groove because if you just hear it gets a little boring so what I do is this so I'll listen to it and I'm like of things. I might want one day want to just do wider spaced intervals. I might do a lot of things, but once I'm warmed up, then I'm free to play the way I want to play. I might just work on a song. I might just... I might do anything. I might play an old Holland song. Maybe... Okay, somebody wrote... Uh, what do I think of strict alternate picking used by Paul Gilbert? Well, I like Paul Gilbert a lot, but he doesn't use strict alternate picking. Watch his latest videos. It's a lot of I use strict alternate picking. When I was younger, that's all I used was alternate picking. Uh, I was a master at it. And now that I've gotten older, I employ different techniques just like Paul. But uh, I've watched some recent videos of him. He's not strict alternate picking. And, you know, he, he doesn't sit there. That's alternate picking. That's all alternate picking. I almost did an economy thing there. I looked and I went, no, I can't do that. Because I, I don't always use uh, alternate like I did. You used to turn the bass control all the way off. Do you still turn the bass off? I did that not so much all the way off, but very low because I had, and that's a great question, because I had the sad face EQ. Whereas if you think of Dimebag, he had a lot of bass, 
a lot of high-end and very scooped mids. And he used that Furman EQ to really scoop things out. You know, so he got that, you know, it's just such a, a unique sound. But I realized when I play rhythm guitar, especially on records, I do that more. Not like Dime. I don't play like Dime. And Dime didn't play like me, but he did study my instructional programs. And he told me so. And he was going to play on my Hands Without Shadows album before that fateful night. I mean, I can't, still can't believe it. But we had the song set up for me. Dime would have been had a guest appearance. It was all set. The next city he was coming to was Chicago. And we had the studio ready. We were ready to go. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously didn't make it and never happened. But anyway, when I record records, I like to scoop the mids for the rhythms. But when I play lead to get that really good sound out. I like a lot of mids. So what I do is think about it AQ wise. Your rhythm guitar is here, but then your lead is like this. So your frequencies are not competing against each other. Listen to my solo albums all the way from the latest one, uh, More Man Than Machine, to my first one, No Boundaries. I have these really heavy rhythm guitars, but that they're, they're scooped more and the lead is thick. And so I only roll off the bass for the lead guitar because I don't really... To me, bass is the enemy, especially on the double. I don't want to hear, leave the bass for the bass guitarist. And so I like to scoop, I like to keep the mids thick and the low end a little bit less so you don't hear, that's so you can hear it very clearly on the low end. Now, it doesn't work for everybody, but my lead sound is pretty standard nowadays for a lot of people. That real thick MIDI sound, you have your delay. You know, a lot of the things that I did back then, they were there was a reason for all this. And, uh, you know, I thought very carefully about my sound and very carefully about how I recorded rhythms, how I recorded leads, and I do till this day. Okay, let's see. Do a... Okay, somebody asked uh, my, you know, your right hand is a freak. Do you play with strong fingers or not? Very interesting question, and thanks again, everybody, for all the questions, because I am genuinely here to help, and I can unequivocally say that I am not a teacher that is biased in any way for, I don't care, one of the things, and Adam can uh, attest to this since he was my student, and he's a great guitarist, and he's been the video person for years now, I always taught people the songs they wanted to learn. And so I always thought about guitar lessons in two ways. If you teach somebody what they want to learn, they become and stay interested. Then you teach them what they need to learn. And so I always had two components to the part of teaching. Because if they only learn what they have to learn, a student, it could get boring really fast and a person could lose interest. But look at Johann Sebastian Bach, two-part inventions. He wrote songs to show techniques in both. That's what I did with No Boundaries. I'm not saying I'm Johann Sebastian Bach, but I took Bach's idea and the song No Boundaries is an exercise on what you're going to learn in Speed Kills. It seemed logical to me. Didn't see people, a lot of people don't know that because they didn't study music the way I did. And I'm not saying my degree makes me a better guitarist. It does not. But I have a lot of knowledge that, that came from going to school because I love to study. Now, when somebody said about my picking hand, hand strength is everything. If you can't make a fist, if you have a hard time just doing this, then you're going to have to work. It means something's going up with your, going wrong with your body. And I don't mean to sound pessimistic, but I, even at my age, I am living proof that speed kills works. Hand strength is key. As a person gets older or as they practice more, sometimes you get these repetitive motion injuries. Just by doing it. Look down picking. Now watch when I do it. Just uh, alternate picking. It's so much easier. It's so much more economical, but it doesn't sound as good. If I did it with alternate. Not because I can pick good, 
It sounds good, but listen up the power of it. It, just sounds, it sounds meaner. You need hand strength. You need to pick aggressively. You need to pick hard. You need to have hand strength on both sides. If it just it, there's a nuance to not picking hard. Not picking hard is okay. It's fine. You, but if you want to be able to do it, if you have hand strength like this, but you don't pick really hard, but you can play really fast, good for you. But I have found for myself, what has saved me a lot is I pick really hard. And what this allows me to do is to get the maximum tone out of whatever guitar I play, which is why it's very difficult for someone to listen to a super expensive guitar unless it's there's If you have two guitars that are very close in shape, let's say an identical shape, but one is a $500 guitar and another is a $5,000 guitar. They have the exact same parts. They have the exact same shape, but they're, one has got wood that's not quite as good as the other one. And you get somebody like me who, who picks really hard like that, it's going to be pretty difficult to tell which one because it's like a drummer hitting that snare super hard. You get a thwack. You know, like Carmine Apice, uh, Vinny Apice, his brother, uh, even Joe from uh, the, the uh, main owner of Sawtooth, Joe Fuco, he hits really hard. He gets a good sound out of the drums. When you hit hard like that, you get the maximum tone out of your instrument. When you play lighter, then it's more nuanced. But as long as you have hand strength, I recommend that you're able to play hard. If you choose to play lighter, that's up to you. It's not like one's better or worse. But for doing clinics as long as I did, which were decades, playing on every kind of guitar and amp known to man, all different levels, I found that 90% of the time I could get my tone. And the only reason that I couldn't get my sound is, believe it or not, it wasn't so much the guitar, it was the amp. Certain amps can't get that round mid-range that I like. Marshalls can do it, oranges can do it, Black Stars can do it, but certain amps, Soldanos, Rivera, some of the boutique amps, even a Boogie Dual Rectifier. It's not that I don't like those amps. I can't get a lead sound to save my life. It's just not there for me. The, the mid-range is not inherent in those amplifiers. Now, the Soldano plug-in is a different story, but uh, and plugins in general are are much more user friendly than than real amps a lot of times because you're dealing with natural acoustics whereas software you're dealing with software you're not really pushing air you're pushing whatever it is you're pushing in that computer I'm not inside privy you know it's not like Tron where I'm one of these little Tron guys goofing around in the uh, oh yes I'm in the RAM today and I might be in the hard drive tomorrow I don't know but I know one thing. That when you get these, when you play loud, when you play hard, when you do things on a guitar that you're practiced at. And I, I have to admit, I, I love to repeat stuff. I'll sit there for... I'll do it over and over. But when you get a discipline and then you work on music on, along with it. I've said this before, but here's what happens. You work specifically on technique. Then you work specifically on songs. What happens is the better you get on this technique, the more it starts to merge with the songs. Perfect example, me. Another perfect example, Ingve. Another perfect example, John Petrucci. So how his technical facility enables him to create the music along with Jordan Rudas and, you know, now Mike Portnoy and, and uh, James Labrie to, to create that music of dream theater. So, you know, even somebody like Michael Schenker, he has a great work ethic when he plays guitar. I've seen him play. I know him. Again, we're not super close friends, but we know each other by name. And, you know, I've spent, you know, numerous shows with, with him and he plays perfect. He's the greatest Michael Schenker he can be. I, he's so accurate when he plays because he practices that. I mean, he just, 
The way he plays is fluid. He's not going to sit there and play Ingve riffs, or he's not going to play no boundaries. But what he does play is so awesome and musical and good and precise. You just go, wow. Okay, let's see. Uh, what is all this stuff? Somebody copy and paste. Who wrote that? Oh, okay. I don't know. Whoa, somebody just wrote the longest message I have ever seen. Okay. Uh, anyway, I think uh, that one needs to be blocked. I don't know. I'm just kidding. But anyway, um, so, yeah, what do you want, man? Stay blessed. What is that? Oh, stay blessed. Wrong, I thought it was. Wrong window. What's that? He pasted that into the wrong window. Oh, okay. Anyway, but uh, I had to look down. I see this message. It's like, oh, my God, it's war and peace. Oh, it's 10,000 pages of death. So anyway, uh, but uh, okay. Okay. Why? Okay, you you play hard. Okay, McKinley, Crooker, this is a sawtooth. So why would you bring in the Kiesel? Think about that one, you know. You're in a you're in a Lamborghini dealership and you start talking about Ferraris. What do you think the Lamborghini dealership thinks about that? So, uh, but anyway, yeah, let's block that person. I hate to say this. Yeah, we get this a lot. People are getting really tricky with with scams. Uh, you know, pages like mine. You know, where you have a good amount of people, they 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 try to post this crazy stuff, and we've been hacked before, but not for a while, and. We block it when we can, but uh, they usually target the pages that have activity, but they're getting pretty slick now. It's becoming more personal, and but you know, we, we don't catch it all the time, but eventually we do. It might, sometimes we get in a few minutes, sometimes a couple hours, but we eventually catch them. So anyway, all I can say, if, yeah, see there, see that Mia Luna? Yeah, yeah let's, let's uh, wow, man, there's some real scammers on here today. Good, I like that. And so... Anyway, but getting back to how to play fast, I love to talk around subjects because there's so many comments, so it's really great. But one of the things somebody said, thinner picks, of course. No, I use thick picks. And when I play lead guitar, especially, I like the teardrop. <laughs> it's really articulate when you're doing the fast stuff. I like a point, a very pointed pick because there's no hit or miss. I, I mean, it is hit or miss. There's no in between. You either hit it or you miss it. And it's more accurate in my humble opinion. Also too, when I play in concert and I'm playing faster metal stuff, what I found is I use a bigger pick, but it's still got a super pointed edge. And I like that bigger pick because it's... It gives you more room when you... You know, the double kicks are going... I found that... These thin picks don't really work as well for me. They're more of a jazz pick, and they're not meant for, for metal rhythms. So I still like the points, but I just use more of a pick. So there's a little bit more freedom. Okay. Uh, what was the question, McKinley? But don't get mad about it. But you got to think, you know, you know, don't. Uh, it's your brand of guitar, but we're sponsored by Sawtooth. So I have, I don't play key, so I don't really know much about them. I think they're a good boutique company from what I've seen. But, you know, that wasn't necessary for a question on technique. Uh, just ask the question. Anyway, uh, but, you know, it's just a little, like, public relations thing that I'm imparting to you. Uh, since I've been to 61 countries and have had to deal with politics, not talking about politics and elections, but the politics of doing business musically in countries where you could have a person shut down the show just because they feel like shutting it down and they have the power to do that. So what I mean in political is how do you deal with people? That's what I meant. So I was just making a comment. And uh, you should join WASH. We have the looks for it for sure. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I had the looks for Nitro. Yeah. 
you know, I have the looks of the band I'm in now, so I just look like me. I try to look like I look. I like the way I look, and I, I think I'm pretty well preserved for my age. I love when Steve Vai and Joe Satriani said that. Joe said something, and then Steve goes, well, I think we're pretty well preserved. Or he said, I think we look pretty good for our age. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm not a druggie. I'm not a big drinker. I don't do any drugs. I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't smoke pot. I don't do anything. You know, I drink occasional beer and wine. I don't drink mixed drinks very often. And uh, so, you know, I think if you stay healthy, that's part of being a good guitar player. Uh, work without a dead sound. Uh, somebody asks, how do you make it work with your, teach us how to make your left hand work without a dead sound. I have to admit, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that. But anyway, uh, let's see what else. I've talked about the topics I want to talk about tonight. We have some new music coming out with the, I'm going to be playing the Viper Room May 31st with Vinny Apice. It's a sawtooth night. I can't wait for that. And uh, the thing that I, I love about playing with this, it's like a sawtooth band. Nils Lawrence, the bass player, is great. He's got great look, cool, killer hair down to his waist. Great singer, really talented bass player. His sound is super thick. So we play as a three-piece. I do the background vocals. It's very almost old school, there's no click track. I play no boundaries, my double guitar, no backing tracks, no click track, no nothing, just raw in your face music. And the reason it works is the drums are hitting hard and the bass is really thick. And that's key. I've actually tried this before and it's not been since I was a kid when we all grew up with that kind of music that I was able to pull off this kind of sound where it's organic. And all the years that I've used tracks and played to a click, I love it and it, it created my style. But that's why I like doing this because it's a 180. There is no click. There are no backing tracks. It's exposed. When I'm playing a lead, there's only bass and drums. There is no rhythm, no click track. I can play as long as I want. It's really, uh, it's really fun to do this. And if you get a chance to be in L.A. at the Viper Room May 31st, every show that I played there, which just hasn't been that many there, we don't play that much, but every one of them has been oversold to the max. And this one, especially with Vinnie Apice doing some of his greatest hits, it's going to be insane. So anyway, I want to thank everyone that's out there. Speed Kills is on sale. There's a 25% off sale called Beyond Speed Kills. Doug wanted me to read a couple things here, and uh, I'll just read this before I go. Many of you uh, have experienced my Speed Kills programs and are experiencing experiencing extraordinary progress. There is a program that has all of my most popular lessons aside from Speed Kills. It's called Beyond Speed Kills, and here's the kicker. It's on sale for the first time since 2022, so 25% off. That's less than 50 bucks. So what happens is this. You get Personally transcribe No Boundaries, Speed Lives, which is Hands Without Shadows, The Finish Line. I teach my songs. I've got a lot of instructional programs with Metal Method, and we call this Beyond Speed Kills. So I just want to say in closing, you know, I've worked with Doug Marks a long time. He's great. He is a really phenomenal teacher, teacher and instructor. And one of the things that I love about him is from the very beginning, from the first time we worked together, his focus was he wants to give everybody what he called a damn good lesson. And that's what we try to do. So anyway, I'm Michelangelo Badio for Sawtooth Guitars. See ya.